Welcome everyone today. Um, for today's colloquium, we have Jenny Wilson. Thank you. Michigan and Adler, who's going to talk about high degree cohomology of special linear groups. Thank you. Is the microphone on already? Yes, wonderful. Great. So thank you so much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. As advertised, I'll be talking about the high degree cohomology of the special linear groups. And in this talk, I will mention uh, results that are joint with various subsets of uh, these co-authors, Benjamin Brooks, Sanders Coopers, Jeremy Miller, Peter Putz, Robin Sroka, and Dan Yasaki. OK. Um, and for the talk, I would like to fix some notation I will be using. Throughout the talk, f is going to denote a number field, by which I mean a finite degree field extension of the rational numbers. And r will denote the ring of integers in f. So by that, I mean solutions in f to monic polynomials with uh, coefficients in the integers. OK, so uh, some examples you might want to keep in mind. The most important example for this talk is going to be just the integers sitting inside the rational numbers. Um, but you might also think of the Gaussian integers inside QA join I. Or here are the Eisenstein integers. They correspond to a triangular grid in the plane um, inside QA join the square root of negative 3. OK. And uh, very broadly speaking, the goal of this program is to say something about the cohomology of the special linear group with entries in this number ring R, uh, so discrete, discrete group, entries in the number ring R, and coefficients in the rational numbers. So this is, these cohomology groups have connections uh, to number theory, to algebraic K theory. There's, there's many reasons to be interested in these groups. Um, I should say by the cohomology of a group, I mean the cohomology of a K pi 1 space associated to this group. So later on in the talk, I'll say a little bit more about how we might think about these cohomology groups in the case of SLNR what this means. Uh, but first, I wanted to draw a picture of a little bit of the, the state of knowledge for these cohomology groups. OK, so here's my picture. Uh, there's cohomological degree here. And the uh, n on the x-axis. And so I'll grab some color. The first result I wanted to mention is that Burrell and Serre computed what's called the virtual cohomological dimension of these groups, which I'll abbreviate VCD. This is, this is computed by Burrell and Serre. Um, and this is a well, this is a quantity with the property that the cohomology with rational coefficients has to vanish in degrees Q higher than the VCD. So what this means is there's this, this VCD, which is the function of n. Borel and Sayre showed that it grows quadratically in n. And that means that these cohomology groups have to vanish above this range. OK, first result. The next result I wanted to mention is a result of Borel, which states that um, if we consider the natural inclusions between these groups, Let's say maybe this one. Let's say the, the map that takes a matrix A to this block upper embedding. Then this map um, will induce isomorphisms on, on the cohomology of these groups once n is large relative to Q. 
So this is a phenomenon called homological stability. And what this means in terms of our picture is that there's some stable range. There's a, a stable range that's, that's linear. Um, after which I have stability. So the groups are isomorphic along these horizontal lines. And the stable groups were computed. Burrell computed the stable groups. And so when the cohomological degree is small relative to n, we have a good understanding of these groups. OK. In contrast, so let me refine our goal. The goal, the focus of today's talk is to say something about these groups instead when the cohomological degree is large relative to n. So today, we'll be focusing on trying to say something about the behavior of these groups if we look at degrees q that are close to this virtual cohomological dimension. OK. So that's the setup. And a motivating question uh, for me, which is open even in the case uh, when r is the integers, a question is, what is the largest degree? What is the largest degree q um, so that these cohomology groups have non-zero cohomology in degree q. OK, so th this question is open even in the case of the integers. And uh, sort of a meta question to this is, uh, how does the answer to this question depend on ring theoretic properties of R? So I will not answer this question today. I don't know the answer to this question. But in that direction, here's another a conjecture, which I also is also open. We'll also not answer this today. This is a conjecture due to Church, uh, Barb, and Putman. They conjectured that in the case, this is in the case R is Z, they conjectured that if we look at the cohomology close to the VCD, so they call this the co-dimension I cohomology of this group, I, I degrees below the VCD, that the rational cohomology will vanish once n is sufficiently large relative to i. OK, so what that means is conjecturally, there's this strip of cohomology below the VCD that's growing linearly in height, where all the cohomology is actually 0 in the case of the integers. OK, that's the conjecture. Uh, here's my plan. I'm going to. What is the missing from the, the, uh, the VC, what is the VCD? What's the definition? What's the definition? The definition of the VCD, a virtual cohomological dimension, is it is the um, common cohomological dimension of all finite index torsion free subgroups of this group. And what knows? And right, it's a, it's, a, it's a fact that shouldn't be obvious, but it's a fact that this quantity bounds what's called the rational cohomological dimension of our group. So that means that if I take SLNR cohomology um, with any coefficient system uh, over the rationals, then this cohomology will vanish above the virtual cohomological dimension. Um, in contrast, if I work with integer coefficients, because, because this group has torsion, I have 
cohomology in arbitrarily high degrees. The, so, I, so the, the VCD, the VCD is known. Um, it is uh, a function, it turns out to be a function of the number of real and the number of complex embeddings of F. So it somehow depends on the Galois theory of F. Um, but uh, maybe, maybe I, should, I should point out that the definition of VCD um, does not guarantee that I will have non-zero cohomology in the VCD. It's the, it's the highest degree where there could potentially be non-vanishing cohomology um, for, for SLNR. For, but, um, and in fact, there's, if, you fall, if you unwrap the definitions in this case, there, does, there is some system of twisted coefficients over Q where I will have non-vanishing cohomology in the VCD. But for just trivial rational coefficients, it's open in, well, I'll say, I'll say something about what's known, but it, it does not follow from the definition of VCD that these groups have to be uh, non-zero in the VCD. Yeah, thanks. Are there other questions? Great. Um, OK, so right, so my plan is I want to briefly, I guess, summarize what we know about the answer to whether this conjecture holds um, and the analogs of this conjecture if I replace Z with a different number ring. And then after that, for the rest of the talk, I'll, I'll back up and I'll talk a little bit more about how we might think about these cohomology groups of these special linear groups um, and sort of how to approach this whole program. OK, so here's my summary of what's known. Um, the first result is if we consider the case of codimension 0, so we're looking at cohomology where the degree is equal. Still, still lost. Yeah, please. So if the for 10 for some group, the VCD is 100. Does that mean there's a, for that group, there's a subgroup of finite index where there is an element, a non-zero cohomology in degree 100, and that 100 is the biggest you can get for any finite index subgroup? Is that what it means? And with yes, that's right, exactly. So if, right, sorry. So if, if the VCD is 100, that means that I have a, that in fact all torsion free finite index subgroups have the property that with some suitable choice of possibly non trivial coefficient systems, they will have non zero homology in that degree, cohomology. For all finite index subgroups, just, not just for some. Yeah, that's right. So there's a theorem of Sarah that says that um, if you have torsion free, uh, finite index subgroups as here, then their cohomological dimensions agree. The, the cohomological dimension oh. will agree for all, for all torsion free finite index subgroups. Yeah. Also non obvious. But does, does yeah. the VCD depend on the choice of coefficient system, or is that also? The VCD, ah, sorry, the VCD, it depends on R, but it does not depend on the choice of coefficient systems. Take a finite index subgroup. Find some coefficient system with that cohomology. Um, that's right. So the the VCD gives, or sorry, the C, the cohomological dimension for these finite index subgroups gives you a cap on where you can have non-vanishing cohomology for all coefficient systems. Yeah. Great. Thank you for all these questions. It's good to be Jack clear. Seems to, I mean, for i equals zero, you don't want that to be zero, right? This, it turns out this is zero when i equals zero. But that's a finite, SLNZ itself is a finite index subgroup. Um, that's right. So actually the first thing is it's not, it's not, well, so what, what that tells me is that, so let i equal zero, there is some system of twisted coefficients where I have non-zero cohomology. But when it equals zero is the conjecture. That's right. It equals, that's right. But the definition of VCD um, doesn't speak to whether or not I have vanishing of rational cohomology if I take trivial rational coefficients. 
So this is non-zero. Well, so what does it speak to again? So it says there exists some system, or in fact, this, sorry, this doesn't quite follow from the definition. In the case of SLNZ, the virtual cohomological dimension agrees with the, the rational cohomological dimension. And that means that there is some, um, there is some representation, some rational representation of SLNZ with the property. Okay, somewhat. Um, so there, yeah, so let me, let me say aside. Um, uh, there exists uh, a Q SLNZ representation, let's say M, such that the, the um, cohomology of SLNZ with coefficients in M in the VCD is not equal to zero. Oh, for some coefficients. But exactly, exactly. For some system, for some possibly VCD twisted coefficient. Like that, some coefficient. Exactly, exactly. The, and I am specifically considering trivial coefficients here. That's right. So in this case, um, yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you for helping me clarify that point, since otherwise it would not be a very good conjecture if it were false by definition. Um, yeah, great. So, right, and in, and in fact, the conjecture, the conjecture is open. Um, so let us take a look at, uh, great, what is known in the direction of this conjecture. So first, let us consider uh, the case of co-dimension zero. So right now I'm looking at the case where Q is equal to the virtual cohomological dimension. And in that case, it's a result of Lee and Charba that whenever R is a Euclidean ring, then we do have vanishing in this top degree. And I'll talk more about this result later, later in the talk. In contrast, Church, Farb, and Putman proved that in the case that R is not a PID, so um, for example, you can, you know, Z adjoin the square root of negative five, I'm told is, is an example that's not a PID. Um, in this case, there is a non-vanishing result. In fact, Church, Farb, Putman proved a, a lower bound on the dimension of these groups in terms of the class number of R. So we have non-vanishing in that case. And um, right, well, these two results leave open the case where R is a principal ideal domain, but not Euclidean. And um, I worked on that case with Miller, uh, Potts, and Yas uh, Yasaki. And what? Remind me, what's the difference between Euclidean PID? Oh yeah, so um, uh, so Euclidean domains are so so. But PID means principal ideal domain. Good. And it's Euclidean. Euclidean implies that it's a PID. It's Euclidean if I have a Euclidean algorithm. So by definition, there's some Euclidean function. You should think analogous to absolute value in the case of the integers so that I, I know what it means to divide and have a remainder that's less in terms of my Euclidean. Right, exactly. So, and, and in fact, right, this, this proof, um, the original proof uses that Euclidean algorithm to somehow generalize the idea of continued fractions. OK. Um, Great. So, right, this last case, I'm a PID but not Euclidean. And um, with these co authors, we showed that in the case of the following quadratic field extensions, we have a, another non vanishing result, um, at least in the case when n is even, it's open when n is odd. What do you use? Uh, I beg your pardon? What do you use? What do I use to prove this? Yeah. Not, not the proof. What do you use? Not the proof. What do you just? What do you use? I so, so uh, yeah. what do you use about those three? What do I use about those three? So let me let me comment on that again at the end because I'm I'm going to gesture a little bit at the ingredients of the proof. But one thing we do. So let me let me make this comment. A fact I learned is that if you assume the generalized Riemann hypothesis, then the only ring missing, the only number ring missing from this list, is the case of negative 19. And in that case, when this quadratic, when uh, field extension was d is equal to negative 19. And um, right, our methods did not apply to this case. 
Um, and the reason is that there are some known calculations of these groups in the case that um, n is equal to 2. And for these three rings, we have vanishing, we have non-vanishing, pardon me, for negative 19, that group is zero. So in these cases, we could somehow bootstrap those non-vanishing results through a spectral sequence to uh, find cohomology classes here. But I'll say more about the proof. Yeah? I'm not sure I understand. What's the theorem of Weinberg on? Sorry, the, um, the, the th sorry, the, um, the theorem of Weinberger is that if you assume the generalized Riemann hypothesis, apparently, then this is a complete list of those R's, thank you, which are uh, non-Euclidean PIDs. Oh, 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 I was thinking you disproved the Riemann. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no. the, the next time I come back, <laughs> my, my next colloquium, yeah, surprise. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, great. OK, so let me briefly say uh, the next situation is that we can look at the co-dimension 1 cohomology. This is 1 degree below the VCD. And in that case, Church and Putman proved that when r is the integers, again, we get the vanishing result. So they proved, they proved the i equals 0 in 1 case of this conjecture. Um, and in work with uh, Coopers, Miller, and Potts, we extended, uh, we, we built on their methods to prove the same result for the Gaussian and Eisenstein integers. Although, interestingly, we also showed that the approach we took does not apply to all rings. It doesn't even apply to all Euclidean rings. And so there is, there's something sort of subtle about the geometric structure of these rings going on here that I think we don't understand at this point. So anyways, in co-dimension one, the situation is largely open. I think it would be natural to conjecture that this might hold for all Euclidean rings, but I don't know. Um, and then finally, in the co-dimension two case with Brooke Miller, Putz, and um, Sroka, we proved the, um, the i equals two case of the conjecture. Okay, thank you. So these, these are the results of the talk. And uh, with that said, I can now go back to talking about foundations, how we might think about these groups, and at least gesture at how we can approach these proofs. Are there any questions before that? Isn't there a decade between these results, like Lee Sharpa and your results? Um, yes, Lee Sharpa is from 1976. Six, yeah. maybe, yeah, and this result is, I forget, from five years ago or something. So there, there is a time gap. Um, all right. So Great, so how can we think about these cohomology groups? I'll tell you how, how I think about these cohomology groups. You'd get a, probably a very different answer if you spoke to a number theorist. Um, but uh, the first tool that we're going to use is virtual Beer-Yekman duality. Uh, B-E-R-E. Sorry, my writing is illegible. B-I-E-R-I. -E okay. And, um, right, here's, here's the story. So, well, let me back up. From the point of view of a topologist, how do I want to think about the cohomology of a group? Well, I want a k pi 1 space. So what that means is I want to construct a covering space action of my group on a contractible space. And then I can take the quotient, take the orbit space, and that orbit space, its cohomology is the cohomology of my group. 
So I'm hoping to construct this action. And especially since I'm interested in the high degree cohomology, I would be really happy if I could set this up so that this orbit space is a closed orientable manifold, because then I could use Poincare duality to study that high degree cohomology. So that's the dream. And unfortunately, we don't get that in this case, but we sort of come close. So here's the setup. The, the first step is that um, we can embed SLNR as a discrete group um, into the group I get by taking an appropriate number of copies of SLN of the reals and SLN of the complex numbers. I'll call this G. OK. And um, so it's, right, this is a discrete subgroup. What are those R's is the real numbers? This R is the real numbers. Yes, yeah, sorry. This is the only time I'll use the real numbers. Yeah. Oh, here, more, more, more lines. Um, and then if I take the quotient of this group by a maximal compact subgroup, then um, I'll, call, I'll call this x. This is what's called the symmetric space. This is called the symmetric space associated to SLNR. Um, and it turns out that it is contractible. OK. OK, so, so far so good. Um, I now have this action of SLNR on this contractible space. Um, and if it were a covering space action, I would be delighted. Unfortunately, it's not. Uh, let, me, let me make this even more concrete. In the case of SL2Z, then uh, x is going to be this, this quotient, SL2R modulo a maximal compact, which uh, in this case, this is sort of an accident of n equals 2. But in this case, we can identify this symmetric space with the upper half plane, with hyperbolic space, using the identification that I send my matrix to, whoops, to the following complex number. And then the action of SL2Z is by linear fractional transformations on the upper half plane. And there's the famous picture of, here's a fundamental domain for this action. So roughly, this means that SL2Z um, tiles the, the plane by translates of this fundamental domain. OK, so here is, here's the picture to have in mind. And right, I wish, I wish it were the case that this. But it's sort of a fundamental domain. Is it actually a fundamental domain? I, uh, it's not a I thought there was some finite isotropy. It's not free. That's right, exactly. Yes, free yes. Free so that's right, yeah. So maybe maybe I'm cheating here in, in using the the term fundamental domain. That's right. But it is it is uh, it is that in fact that's exactly where I'm going. So I wish this were a covering space action, but it's not exactly for the reason that you just said, that unfortunately we have some torsion. We have I mean we have stabilizers. So, right, so good and bad news. Um, well, just put quotes around fundamental domain. I will put quotes around fundamental domain, yes, with my. Sort of I, I think maybe, maybe I'm mistaken in, in the definition of this term, but it, it is certainly true that there, is, there are stabilizers. I mean, there are, right. Um, OK, so. Uh, Great. So we have our action in general, SLNR, acting on its symmetric space. And uh, 
some good news about this setup is that the symmetric space is a smooth manifold. Okay. And so it's free except for finite subgroups in general, right? It's about to say. Yes, exactly. So that's that that is exactly what I was about to say okay. next. It is almost a covering space action. It is an action that is called properly discontinuous. <laughs> Um, which means that if the action were free, it would be a covering space action, and I would get a k pi 1. But the action's not free. So sad news, it's not a free action. Um, right, but some redeeming news is that the stabilizers are finite. And what that means, the fact that stabilizers are finite, means that even though the quotient is not a k pi 1 space, the cohomology of the quotient rationally still agrees with the cohomology of my group. OK? So st stabilizers, right, stabilizers are finite, stabilizers of points. And so this implies that the cohomology of this quotient space with rational coefficients agrees with the group cohomology of our group with rational coefficients. Um, and you're welcome to take this as the definition of, this, of these cohomology groups. Um, OK. Another piece of disappointing news is that it's, it's not the case that the quotient space is an orientable closed manifold. So unfortunately, we don't get Poincaré duality for these uh, cohomology groups. So, right, so the quotient is not compact. Um, which we can, we can infer from this picture. So this, this is a picture of a, this fundamental domain is finite volume in the hyperbolic geometry, but it has a cusp, it's not compact. Um, OK. And um, there is good news here, too. And that is that Borel and Serre defined what they call a bordification of the space x in order to make the quotient compact. So let me write down a few notes about that. Um, I'm just using that they're finite. That's right. Um, yeah, that's right. I, I guess the well, I, I can say I can say if you ask me afterwards, I can comment on uh, why this should follow. Okay, great. Um, Okay, so, sorry, so Burrell and Serre constructed what they call a bordification. They added something that I will call the boundary. They added, they added additional stuff. They added additional stuff that's somehow indexed by stabilizers of flags in our group. And the result is this space x bar, which is, um, well, formally, it's what you'd call a smooth manifold with corners. OK, topologically a manifold with boundary. Um, it is still contractible. This is a homotopy equivalent, so this is um, contractible. And the action of SLNR extends over this boundary that they've introduced. Um, and it has the property that the quotient is now compact. And so 
Great. The upshot of all of this that we'll see in a moment is that we get a twisted version of Poincaré duality for these groups. Okay. Um, in order, right, in order to state what I mean by that, the last point is that the boundary is homotopy equivalent to um, a complex that I'll write Tn of f. This is the Tietz building. OK. And this Tietz building, oh, let me give us a definition of it as a simplicial complex. The Tietz building is a simplicial complex. Its vertices, its vertices correspond, sorry? Oh, sorry, yes. Yeah. So um, R is my ring of integers in my number field oh, F. F. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for reminding me of that. And in fact, F, F is the field of fractions of R. So if you, if you want, you are happy to just think every time I write this down, you can think that R is the integers and F is the rationals, um, if that's your, if you're, if so inclined. Great. OK, so this Tietz building, this is the simple, simplicial complex that comes from flags in the vector space f to the n. The vertices of this complex are um, non-zero proper uh, subspaces of fn. OK, and a collection of vertices will span a simplex if and only if they form a flag. OK, so this is the Tietz building. And topologically, I've wanted all my life. <laughs> yeah, it's great. I love this building. Yeah. It's, it's a good one. Um, awesome. So this is the Tietz building. And um, it's a theorem of Solomon and Tietz that topologically, that topologically, this, um, this Tietz building is a wedge of spheres. It is homotopy equivalent to a wedge of countably many spheres of dimension n minus 2. And an important takeaway from this is that this Tietz building has a single non-vanishing homology group, reduced homology group, in degree n minus 2. OK, coming, coming from these spheres. And the upshot of this entire bordification storyline is that the existence of the borel sayer bordification plus the solomon Tietz theorem together, so, so solomon Tietz, um, solomon, sorry, Tietz, uh, plus a suitable version of Poincaré uh, Lefschetz duality implies the following isomorphisms. This implies that I have isomorphisms between the co-dimension I cohomology of SLNR and the degree I uh, homology of SLNR, um, but with coefficients in a non-trivial SLNR representation. This is called the Steinberg module.
And this Steinberg module is, by definition, this is the reduced homology, this one non-vanishing reduced homology group of the Tietz building. OK. So again, the upshot of this whole story is that even though these, these groups S, L, and R do not satisfy Poincaré duality, they do satisfy this twisted form of Poincaré duality. And that means to study these high degree cohomology groups, I can instead study low degree, sorry, the high degree cohomology groups, I study low degree homology groups at the expense of working with twisted coefficients. And so now, let me, let me remind us of um, one way that we can compute, uh, I mean, cohomology with twisted coefficients. And again, you're, I mean, you're welcome to take this as the definition, if you wish. So to compute these groups, to compute these groups, I'll compute these groups, to compute these groups with, um, with twisted coefficients. Step one is to take a flat resolution of my coefficient module, so of my Steinberg module, um, by rational, by so flat rational S, uh, SLNR representations. Okay. Step two is to take SLNR covariance. Okay, take SLNR covariance. Exactly. So let me, I'll write down what this means. Remind us in just a second. Okay, so I'm going to drop the last term, take covariance, where a reminder that covariance of the action of a group on a representation, um, by definition, means um, take the largest quotient where the group acts trivially. So I take, I mod out by the action of my group. OK. So I take my flat resolution. I mod out by the action of the group. The result is a chain complex. And I take the homology of that complex. The homology of the complex are my homology groups. All right. And so the upshot of all of this is that our, our initial goal of understanding the high degree cohomology of, this, of these special linear groups has now become the goal of finding nice resolutions of the Steinberg module, where by nice, I mean a flat resolution. So what is that? What is, sorry, what? Flat. Oh, flat means that, um, free. yeah, I'll take it to be free. That's right. So, so flat means uh, modules that are exact when you, w w w well, like when you tensor. You can take it to be free then. Let's, let's take it to be free. Good idea. We can, we can, you can always do that. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, uh, Right, so I want a resolution of this Steinberg module um, with the property, first of all, that these are flat or free or you know, satisfy this algebraic condition. Um, and importantly, it needs to be small enough that I have a hope of being able to calculate these covariants. Okay, and so this whole program of understanding the cohomology of these special linear groups 
is somehow now a problem of understanding the topology of these, of these Tietz buildings and trying to come up with a nice description, a nice resolution for their homology. So that's right. The Tietz, the Tietz module, the, sorry, the, the, the Steinberg module is exactly that's right. It's the one non-vanishing reduced homology group of my Tietz building. Which is just a wedge of spheres. Which is just a wedge of spheres. That's right. That's right. And so right. The action just them? The action. Um, that is a great question. So regrettably, I don't think I'm going to have time to give. There is a very nice generating set for this homology group that comes from, well, almost comes from bases of f to the n. Um, and so that generating set, right, this action of SLNR, this, uh, this sorry, there, there's these, what are called apartments in these Tietz buildings. There are spheres in these Tietz buildings that are associated to bases for f to the n, and there's a nice picture I can draw. So maybe maybe somebody will indulge me and ask me after after the talk to draw a picture of an apartment in the Tietz building. Um, but that's right. So these these spheres are indeed permuted by the action of this symmetric group. Um, however, the apartments uh, do not. The the associated homology classes they generate the Steinberg module, but they're not a basis for the Steinberg module. Um, so that is to say there are very nice kind of symmetric descriptions of a generating set of spheres um, that don't form a, but it, they don't form a basis. Uh, great, where was I? Uh, let's see here, so I only have a couple minutes left. Um, yeah, so let me uh, let me think. Right, so I'll, I'll write down this remark. So our, our goal, our initial goal restated, the goal of understanding this high degree cohomology is now to compute nice resolutions of um, the Steinberg module. Okay. And um, let me gesture. Do I have time? Uh, let me talk really fast and I will say something about how we can understand this result of Lee and Charba on the vanishing of the top degree cohomology group um, when R is Euclidean. So uh, let me remind us that, well, if I take the case at I equals 0, then that's the same as by this isomorphism. It's naturally isomorphic to the 0 with homology of the special linear group with coefficients in the Steinberg module. And that is isomorphic to the SLNR covariance of the Steinberg module. So this isomorphism tells me that um, the top degree of this, um, these top degree groups are going to be isomorphic to The, this quotient of our Steinberg module by the action of SLNR. And so to prove vanishing of these groups, what I want to do is come up with a generating set for the Steinberg module that I can, with the property that I can verify that all of those generators vanish when I take covariance. Okay? And To look at the very first example of this, um, uh, 
Oh, I don't really have time to say this, do I? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, I'm out of time. Well, let me, let me, I'll just write down um, very quickly that the, is, is the clock on the wall accurate? We started a few minutes late. Yeah, we still have five minutes. I have five minutes? Oh, okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, great. So let me say in five minutes that um, by definition, if I take n equals two, then my Tietz building is just the discrete set of lines in F2. And in this case, the Steinberg module associated to this Tietz building, by definition, is the reduced degree zero homology of this discrete set of lines. And so this, by definition, this is just the abelian group on formal differences of lines in F2. Um, okay. So great. So this is a generating set for the Steinberg module. So we're trying to prove that this, that this abelian group vanishes when we pass to SL2R covariance, And the big hiccup in all of this is that these Tietz buildings are defined in terms of the field, but we are only acting by the room, S, uh, by the, uh, the, sorry, the, the group SLNR. So this would be easy if I had an F there instead of an R, um, but I don't, so my action is more limited. Okay, so I want to check that these vanish in the case that R is a Euclidean ring. And uh, so let's, let's see what we can do. If we consider the case, we'll specialize to R equals Z, and consider the generator that is the formal difference of these two lines, so the formal difference of the, the x-axis minus the y-axis, Here's an observation. If I take the following permutation matrix in SL2Z, uh, almost a permutation matrix, I added this negative one so I'd get determinant one. But if I take this matrix, this matrix is going to act on these two lines by swapping them. And so what that means is that G is going to act on this class in my Steinberg module by negation. And so because we're acting, we're, because we're working rationally, that means that x is going to vanish when we take covariance. Okay, so x is 0 in covariance. Great, so, so that was pretty easy in this case. We might hope that we could play the same trick with all of these formal differences of lines, with all of the generators for this group. And unfortunately, that is not going to work. And here's, here's an example of a generator where, where it will not work. So in contrast, if I look at the difference in the lines, uh, the x-axis, minus the line spanned by 2, 3, uh, it's, it's an exercise that there is no element G in SL and SL2Z that swaps these lines. And the problem is, at least morally speaking, the problem, the thing that went right here and went wrong here, is that if I take um, if I take the generator one zero of the integer points of this line, and I take the generator zero one of the integer points in this line, those two generators give me a basis for Z two, not just Q two, but Z two. And here, that's not the case. So the problem is that these two elements are not, not a basis for, 
for Z2, they, they're, they're a basis for an index three subgroup. And so, right, so what that means is at least this naive approach to this problem will fail. And the key in this case to proving this result is to show that in fact, as an abelian group, this is generated by elements like this that come from an integer basis. So, the key, the key to proving the vanishing of covariance is that, in fact, this Steinberg module um, is generated by, I'll write it this way, I'll say it's generated by the SL2Z orbit of this standard basis here. And so that, that's also an interesting exercise. In fact, I claim the analogous statement is true if I replace Z with any Euclidean ring. And so it's an interesting exercise to see if you take the difference of any two lines to try to come up with uh, a path between this line and this line that goes entirely through pairs of integer bases. And to do that, you can use the Euclidean algorithm, it turns out. And so um, this, this little example is meant to illustrate really what the whole game of this program is, which is to show that we can come up with resolutions that have good integrality properties. We want to show that we can come up with a resolution of the Steinberg module where the generators and the relations and all the higher syzygies come from bases of R to the N and not just from bases of F to the N. And then it's in that case, once you've done that, it's really easy to write down matrices that negate those generators and covariance. And the key to doing that is to use some sort of uh, simplicial complex techniques to kind of run a spectral sequence argument comparing the Tietz building to simplicial complexes that are built out of bases for R to the N. Um, and I'm happy to talk more with anybody about that. But let me, I'll just write this down um, in conclusion. So, so conclusion is um, the game is to find resolutions with good integrality properties. And thank you, that's everything I wanted to say. Please. Uh, so the last point you were just mentioning is that instead of trying to resolve the Steinberg module, you resolve the test building by some simplicial complex build from the ring R instead of the field. Is that um, that's right, yeah. So somehow to study the Steinberg module, we want to show, I mean really what we want to show is that there is some map into the Tietz building from some other simplicial complex that is built out of bases of the, uh, like the, the free abelian group in, in the integer case, so built out of bases for Zn. We want to map from that complex into the Tietz building, and we want to argue that that map induces a surjection in the appropriate degree homology, and then that will tell us that somehow well, then, then we want to understand, I guess we need to understand the homology of this other, this other complex, but then this other complex will have, if suitably constructed, will have homology classes that are built out of bases for Z to the N and not out of bases for Q to the N. And so that will tell us that the Steinberg module is generated by these favorable generators that um, play nicely with, with SL and Z. Oh yeah, so the simplicial, well, so the, um, right, the, 
I, I will lie slightly when I tell you, in the co-dimension zero case, you can use the simplicial complex that is just the realization of the poset of partial bases for z to the n. So, right, so a, a vertex is a partial basis and the, um, the simplices come from flags of partial bases for z to the n, where a partial basis is by definition a subset of a basis, equivalently the basis for a direct sum end. Um, and uh, the, the challenges, I guess, of these, well, the, to, to um, prove Church, uh, let me see, oh, Church Putman, this result and, and this result both end up modifying the complex I just described by gluing in new cells um, to build something that's higher dimensional. And somehow the, the hardest part of the proof is to run the formal machinery. You need this other complex that we're constructing to have homotopy groups vanishing in a range. So actually the bulk of these papers um, are about proving that some simplicial complex that's built out of bases for, say, free abelian groups um, to show that these complexes are, uh, have homotopy groups that vanish in a range. Uh, oh, sorry, really we need to know that the homology groups vanish. Oh. But um, I, we use, the toolkit we use in fact proves that homotopy groups vanish, which implies that if, if you can get homotopy groups vanishing in a range, then oh. you're guaranteed that homology will vanish in that range. Yeah, yeah thank you. That's a, that's a good question. <laughs> Are there other questions? Let's thank Jimmy again.